In this learning statement now, let's take a look at this transaction or a trade that is called the forward rate agreement or the FRA. To understand this trade, let's take a step back and go back to the mechanics of a very simple trade that we are now very well familiar with and that's a forward. So I'm assuming here that I have a long position in this forward. The forward gets initiated at time t equal to zero. And at that time, we decide upon a few things. The first thing which we decide upon is the underlying asset. What will be traded? Number one. Number two, we decide on the quantity. So how much will be traded? That, that's number two. Number three, we decide on what is the delivery date let's call it time t equal to capital t and lastly and the most important one we decide on the pre-agreed price at which this exchange will happen f0 t then finally when we arrive at this time t equal to capital t then the long party it takes delivery of the underlying asset the asset at that time let's say is worth this amount st and in return, it pays back to the short party a pre-agreed amount F0T, which was, which was decided at time T equal to zero. Okay, So that's how the, the mechanics of a simple forward works. Now, if somebody were to ask this question, I want to take the essence of this forward, you know, something which you've just described, and create another forward which has an interest rate as the underlying okay so that's that's what we want to achieve now let's take a look at interest rate being the underlying what all nuances it throws at us the first thing which you have to figure out if interest rate forms your underlying is which interest rate that's the first question you have to tackle Typically speaking, when you talk about FRAs, they trade on the LIBOR rate, the London Interbank Offer Rate as the underlying. We will denote this unknown rate as RM. Okay, RM would stand for the market rate. Why did I say it's unknown? Because you have to understand one thing, and that is if you design a forward which has this interest rate as the underlying, then you can't just exchange interest rate directly. Okay, Interest rate, if it forms the underlying, it has to be a variable which goes into the computation of a cash flow. Typically, that cash flow is the interest which has accrued over a lending or a borrowing period, Okay, as the case may be. Now, typically speaking, this lending or borrowing period doesn't start as of today because if it started as of today, then the rate of interest which applies to this lending slash borrowing period would already be known today. That means this FRA would not serve any purpose. FRA, if at all we were able to design it, would be required for or used for hedging uncertainty in movements in interest rates. So if I am focused on a period which let's say begins as of today, then the interest rate applicable for that period, as I just said, is already known to me. It's the period which is, which is the interest rate which is quoted to me as of today. Right? So if that interest rate is known to me, then I am not using this FRA to hedge the uncertainty in that interest rate. That interest rate is pretty certain. So let's do this. Let's move this lending slash borrowing period for which this interest rate applies to a period in the future. Because if we do that, we indeed do have uncertainty about what the interest rate will be at the beginning of this period and then the FRA can come in and help us hedge the uncertainty around this interest rate. I'll do this use case in a lot of detail in a few minutes. So let's do this. Let's start you know, or keep this, this mechanics in mind and let's try and see how the mechanics of the FRA will look like. Let's do that. The first thing, if you were to, let's say, you know, write down or draw this diagram for a long position in the FRA, I just told you that you have to first tell me what the underlying rate would be. And the second thing you have to tell me is what this lending slash borrowing period will be. OK, so to, to answer this question, the FRA is known by two times. It's called a T1 slash cross T2 FRA. Okay. Now, if it's T1 cross T2, 
it means the lending slash borrowing period it starts at time t1 and it ends at time t2 that means the interest rate will which will be applicable for this lending slash borrowing period is the rate which is quoted at time t1 so if i am standing at time t equal to zero i would not know what this rate would be only when i reach this time t equal to t1 will i get to know what is the market or LIBOR rate which is applicable for this period which is T2 minus T1 the period between time T2 and the time T1 okay so this is the first thing which you have to note. the second thing which you have to note is in the long position in a forward what did we do we received the underlying and we paid a pre-agreed amount for it okay I just told you that interest rates can't be directly received or paid. You have to pay or receive cash flows or interests that are based on or calculated using these interest rates. So let's use the same logic. That means when this FRA finally expires and the expiry date of this FRA will be T2, let's receive the underlying or re let's receive a cash flow which is based on the underlying and let's pay something which is a pre-agreed or fixed so in a long position what will i do i will receive an interest amount which is based on the market rate which was given to me at time t equal to t1 and i will pay an interest rate which is based on a pre-agreed interest okay I'll, I should say I will pay an interest rate interest amount that is based on a pre-agreed interest rate let's call that pre-agreed interest rate RK let me rephrase this once more so that you understand it really well when I start at time t equal to zero the rate which I am focused on is RM think of this rate RM to be the lending slash borrowing rate which is available to me at time t equal to t1 and is applicable to a lending slash borrowing period which starts at time t equal to t1 at ends and ends at time t equal to t2 so as far as the uncertainty around this trade is concerned the uncertainty is fully resolved by time t equal to t1 because that's the time at which i finally get to know what this rm is okay so beyond this time t equal to t1 all we are doing is we are letting RM go ahead and let it accrue an interest amount based on this RM. That's all we are doing after time t equal to t1. There is no uncertainty beyond time t equal to t1. Okay. Then when we reach time t equal to t2, we are saying that we will exchange two cash flows or let's say we will exchange the netted amount of these two cash flows. I'll quickly tell you in a few minutes what that amount is. But in the spirit of this forward, I'm just saying, let me receive something which is based on the underlying, which is this interest amount, notional times RM times the period over which this interest is accrued for. And let me pay something which is fixed or pre-agreed. And that is notional times this rate RK, which was pre-agreed when I went into this FRA transaction that times the period over which this interest rate accrues for okay so that's how the fra mechanics will work now if you were to take a look at what all needs to be decided for this fra to be designed for you let's take a look at all that needs to be decided now the first thing that you need to note is that fra is an otc transaction so to make this fra work what we have to do is you have to pick attributes and aspects such as the notional amount so what na would you work with you have to work with, you have to decide the t1 and t2 when you decide t1 and t2 you have automatically decided t2 minus t1 which is the lending slash borrowing period let's call the length or duration of this period by tau that's what you've decided then you also need to decide what will be the underlying and as i said it's usually the LIBOR okay so these are attributes that you need to decide upon now let's jump into the use case of where and when the FRA will be useful for and to what kind of market participant let's assume that you are a party in the market some participant let's call you as party A 
and let's assume that you are in the market actually to borrow not as of today but let's say as of a future date which begins or a future period I should say which begins at time t1 and finishes at time t2 the length of this period is tau okay let's decide what kind of risk do you face the rate at which you will be able to borrow on that future date is not known to you let's say that rate is rm and as we just said this rate will be revealed to you when you finally land at this date t1 let's decide what kind of exposure do you have do you have a long exposure or do you have a short exposure so if this rm goes up you are a borrower it's not in your best interests that means you make a loss variable going up you making a loss that means it's a short exposure let's write it down your core exposure which you are sitting on because of the needs that you have in future is a short exposure okay now let's do this you are facing this risk that rm is going to go up let's see if the fra can help you if you can enter into the fra and because your chosen period is from t1 to t2 let's enter into a t1 cross t2 fra that's the first thing now we have to decide if we have to enter into a long fra or a short fra so if i enter into a long fra let's just you know take it as a trial let me try and see if it works for me or not then i'll be receiving this amount narm tau and paying out the amount nark tau okay so if i receive this amount you know this guy this can very well be passed on to anybody whom i will you know arrange this borrowing from let's say this is like an external lender okay so this guy would want me to pay this rate rm the fra counterparty will pay me a cash flow which is also based on rm so in that sense these two cash flows can take care of one another i receive it from the fra counterparty and i use that cash flow to pay my interest to my external lender okay so this is automatically taken care of net net then what has happened if these two cash flows can offset one another then net net it means that i have as we've been you know referring to i have been able to lock in the interest rate that i finally pay on the borrowing which will start on a future date i have locked in that interest rate to rk so the fra and that to a long position in the fra has helped me hedge my interest rate risk okay that's the use case of a borrower now let's do this let's take the use case of another guy let's call him party b this party b wants to lend money he doesn't have the money right now let's say his money will come to him at t1 and that's when he will be in a position to lend this money and he wants to lend this money till time t2 that means for a duration tau so the interest that he will receive on this lending is not known to him it will be known to him when he reaches that time t1 when it's the time to lend and at that time let's say the interest is being quoted as rm okay now what is the risk of this party this party will at time t2 receive an interest which is notional times rm times tau rm was fixed at time t1 before t1 it's an unknown number so the risk which party b is running is that rm will go down that's the risk it is running what kind of exposure is this something going down means a loss for you that means something going up will mean a gain that's a long exposure so let's write it down so this party at its core is facing a long exposure it wants to hedge this exposure and we can see here that it's a short fra that will help it hedge it okay so what we've seen in the two cases is short exposure can be hedged with a long fra and a long exposure can be hedged with a short fra let's quickly take a look whether it's, it helps us do that or not you will be receiving the pre agreed interest okay so a, a cash flow based on the pre agreed interest rate and you will be paying out a cash flow based on the rm that is revealed to you at t1 
these two cash flows one comes in one come goes out take care of one another so net net what has happened is that the party b is able to lock in the interest rate that it will receive on any lending that it does for a future lending slash borrowing period and the interest rate that it has locked in is rk the rate which was promised by the fra okay so this is the use case of the fra now i talked to you about netting of cash flows so if you were to write down these cash flows on a netted basis you you'll arrive at numbers which look like this a long party it receives a cash flow from the long position in the FRA, which looks something like this. NA times RM minus RK, it's the, the rate which is unknown to you, finally gets known to you at T1, minus the pre-agreed rate RK, that times tau. Compare this with the payoff of any general forward. Remember, the payoff of a forward was ST minus F0T. Now, the way we have transitioned ourselves from this simple forward to the FRA, what have we done? The first things first, as I told you, interest rate itself can't be exchanged. So we have retained the spirit of this payoff, which is the unknown, which gets revealed to us at the time T1. That minus the pre-agreed, that part has been retained here. But we need to also scale this difference by two amounts, the notional and the period over which this lending slash borrowing happens for and then only we arrive at the final net cash flow okay short party in the normal you know usual forward the short party's payoff was this it was a fixed minus variable that's the same thing here fixed minus variable but needs to be scaled by notional times the length or duration of the lending period okay now before we stop and actually take a look at an example there is one nuance which the FRA throws at us and that is, let's take a look. I told you that when we reach time T equal to T1, the uncertainty around this forward transaction, the FRA has finally resolved. Why is that the case? Because you, at that point, you already know what this RM is. The only thing which is now left to do is let's allow this RM and the RK accrue their respective interest amounts and then let's exchange the difference at time t equal to t2 from the perspective of parties which are party a and party b this works out quite well because they also have a cash flow at time t2 the party a which was a borrower needs to pay a certain interest at t2 and the party b which was a lender receives a certain interest at time t2 one of the two cash flows of the FRA, it helped these parties offset the cash flows which they have to pay or receive. Okay, So in that sense, it works quite well. The FRA works quite well for these two parties. But let's do one thing. Let's go with the understanding that since our uncertainty around this FRA has already resolved by the time we reach T1, let's not settle this payoff at time t2 why wait till time t2 we can always settle this payoff much earlier as well so what we do is we calculate this payoff when we reach time t1 and we discount it to time t1 at the fair rate on that day and that rate is rm okay so we take rm we calculate the cash flow which will be exchanged at time t2 and discount it to today which is time t1 by the way i'm assuming that i'm standing at time t1 and i settle it as of today itself the discount factor which i'm using is one upon one plus rm into tau now this brings me to an important point and that is how is rm and rk quoted okay rm is the libor rate rk is the fra rate the forward rate both these rates Keep in mind, they are coated with a compounding frequency that gels with or is in sync with this period T2 minus T1. So if I trade a forward, which is let's say a three month cross six month forward, that means T2 minus T1 is three months. And it means that RM and RK will be coated with a 
quarterly compounding. They'll still be annualized numbers, but they will be quoted with quarterly compounding. So if there is a question which quotes you these rates on a continuous compounding before you compute these cash flows, please convert the rate to the right compounding frequency before you do any computation, okay? Now let's put everything to use and apply it to a very quick example. Let's do that. So this example says we are given that the 9 month and 12 month LIBOR rates are respectively 2.4% and 2.8%. Let's write them now. So the 9 month forward uh, 9 month LIBOR rate is 2.4% and the 12 month LIBOR rate is 2.8%. What is the forward LIBOR rate for the period between 9 months and 12 months? That's the first part of the question. This, this is something which we know by now. So to calculate the forward rate, let's keep in mind the compounding frequency for both of these rates. And let's write down the formula. It would be 1 plus F. Let's assume this is the forward rate between 9 months and 12 months. It needs to be scaled by the compounding period. That's 0.25 or 1 by 4. Since 9 months and 12 months, they only have a single quarterly period. So this will be to the power 1. This should be equal to 1 plus R, which is 12 months, needs to be scaled because of quarterly compounding. So 1 by 4. This is over 4 periods. It's 12 months, which contains 4 quarters. That divided by 1 plus R, 9 months. This times 1 by 4. This is three periods. Let's substitute these values 2.4% and 2.8%. Do this calculation and you would see that the forward rate it comes to 4%. That's the first part. Now if you were to initiate a 9 month cross 12 month FRA wherein you receive 3.6%. So this guy is your RK, the fixed rate. So RK is 3.6% and you receive it and you pay LIBOR on a notional amount of 20 million okay so the first question is is this fra a long or a short position so take a look you are receiving something which is based on the rk and you are paying out something which is based on the rm so this is a short position if all the rates above are quarterly compounded and LIBOR can be used as the risk-free discount rate then estimate the value of this fra from your perspective to calculate the value of this FRA, let's first write down what will we receive at time T2, which is 12 months in this case. So at time T2, the cash flow which we are in for will be the notional amount, this times the difference between RK, the pre-agreed rate, minus the rate revealed at time T1, which is 9 months, this times tau. This is what we will receive. Now at this point, I am not taking into account that PV adjustment which I told you about. That PV adjustment is a very fair value adjustment. It just does not change the value of this FRA. So I am assuming that this is a position which gives me this cash flow. This happens at time 12 months and I need to find the fair value of this cash flow as of today which is time t equal to zero for that i would need to do two things the first thing is i need to find out what is an appropriate or fair value to put in this cash flow formula for this rate rm because when i'm standing at time t equal to zero i don't know what this rate rm will be that's my first you know first thing which i have to do the second thing which i have to do is i need to discount this cash flow to today and for that i'll use the 2.8 percent interest rate because i am i'm told here that libor can be used as the risk-free discount rate so first question for the rm a fair input for the rm can be the implied forward rate from the two spot rates 2.4 percent and 2.8 percent this forward rate okay at the stage we are in in this curriculum just take it that the fair value or the expected value of this rm can be set to be equal to the implied forward rate so let's do that now let's compute the value of the forward as of today and it will turn out to be let's substitute the values it will be 20 million this times 3.6 percent minus 4 percent this times 0.25 
five for the quarterly period discounted to today at 2.8 percent so this will be one plus 2.8 percent times one by four raise it to the power four for four periods this amount it comes to minus nineteen thousand four four nine okay now at this stage let me just highlight something to you and that is like any forward when the forward starts it should be fair to both parties that means if you did initiate this forward at a fixed rate rk of 3.6 percent it was not really a fair trade to you okay because the value of this forward is negative from your perspective so from your perspective you should have actually initiated this trade at a fair rate of four percent because that would have made the value of this fra as of today to be equal to zero okay so this was a quick treatment on this instrument called the fra what we did was we transitioned away from a simple forward which we saw how an FRA can be constructed. Then we took a look at how the FRA appealed to two kinds of market participants, lenders and borrowers who want to do this lending and borrowing as of a future start date, a future lending or borrowing period. And then we finally applied this concept and the you know calculations for the forward to a quick example.